Thank you very much. Uh, it's my honor and my pleasure to be here with you today. I'm very honored to have been invited to participate in uh, Tech Plus 2010. Um, and in a way, there is a wonderful fit between what Dr. Wong was presenting when he was saying we want basically to become total solution, we want to drive convergence, and we want to become a global magnet and the leading country in the world. Because what I'm going to be presenting to you is the same experience, not at the level of a country, I would not dare to try to do this, but at the level of companies. And really saying, you know, if we think of leading companies, that have been innovating in interesting and different ways and that have been gaining leadership on the global scene, how have they done it? What is different about some of these companies? And what I want to argue with you is a very simple idea. The very simple idea is the following, that a lot of conventional wisdom, a lot of what we know traditionally is companies build global leadership based on first home country leadership. So you first acquire leadership at home, you first build competencies, skills and capabilities, and then essentially as further markets, as other markets develop, you are able to leverage and expand those capabilities and competencies in these various markets. That has been the traditional model, the model on which most multinational companies are built. Now that assumes that you have resources at home, you have advantage coming from the home base, which is not necessarily the case, and which even if it is the case can still be complemented by an approach which is much more learning and innovating from the world uh, and for the world, much more thinking about where am I going to acquire and find pockets of competencies and capabilities around the world, how am I going to go into sensing them, being able to understand and appropriate these pockets of capabilities and knowledge? How am I going to basically be able to meld them? What kind of magnets am I going to build in order to bring them together and how can I leverage them globally? So what I would like to discuss with you in the short time I, we have today is essentially this model. We called it the meta-national model because it's, it's essentially extending beyond nations without wanting to be above nations. It's actually a very humble model. It's a model of companies saying we can learn from everywhere around the world and we'll bring our competencies and capabilities together. Let me just give you some examples. What can we learn from history? And I'm just going to go very quickly. Nokia versus Motorola. Nokia has now its share of trouble managing some of the difficulties on some of the issues that Todd Bradley was referring to. That's something which works for HP. But Nokia, nonetheless, is still the number one mobile phone company in the world, coming with Samsung closely behind, I know. Uh, but if you go back some years, Nokia's initial success was the ability of this small Finnish company to become a very global organization, a very global company very, very quickly, when its major competitors, Motorola, for instance, were not. Starbucks is a combination of American mass merchandising with Italian capabilities and Italian flair for what is a good coffee and what is a nice coffee bar. And Airbus has been bringing competencies and capabilities from all over Europe and to some extent from all over the world much earlier than Boeing and has been able to take an unexpected leadership role in the aerospace industry. It's only today with the Boeing 787 Dreamliner that Boeing is trying to catch up by having global a global net of capabilities and competencies being brought into the play. And you know that this is very difficult. I'm not going to go through all these examples. Let me take a few more. That doesn't seem to work. I'm sorry, this doesn't seem to work. Oh, now it is. Um, Polygram has been taking advantage of our leadership against EMI in music. Shiseido is a very interesting company. You could take Amore Pacific in this country as an example as well. But here are companies which start from not the heart of the perfume industry in the world and which are able to develop a perfume business quite successfully. Shiseido went into France 
and basically created a perfume business in France, thinking, again, not to try to project what they knew from Japan, but on the contrary, trying to learn from the rest of the world what they could put to use, both within the global context and also in Japan. Uh, Kao has not been able to do the same at all. Intel, on the one side, with the exception of Israel, has remained a very American company. ST Microelectronics, which was seen as a failing European company back 15, 20 years ago, has been able to become one of the leading semiconductor companies in the world. Unilever and Nestle, standard chartered, very fragmented locally, and Citibank having much more of an advantage and so on. We could go and, and the list could go on and on and on. What I want to do is not really to focus on that list. Uh, what I want to do is just show that there is an advantage. If you take the companies on the right side, starting with Nokia and all of the others, these were not given winners. These were people who were able to turn themselves into global magnets, turn themselves into bringing experience and expertise from around the world. And it's interesting, even the companies in the heartland of Silicon Valley share some of the same perspective today. A few years ago, I was giving this kind of presentation to companies in uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, I'd brought, I was, uh, to sustain the argument, I brought this list which I got from Wired magazine, saying, you know, there are other places around the world which count. It's not just all kind of Palo Alto-centric. In a very interesting way, I was a little afraid. I was thinking people would just, you know, tell me, well, look, we have everything we need on our doorstep. We don't even need to look anywhere else. And actually what happened is some of the participants started raising their hands and saying, oh, but you are missing some places. And it's interesting, we went into this little exercise, there were about a few hundred people in the audience, I said, okay, what places am I missing? And, you know, within a few minutes we had built another list. Hyderabad in India, Budapest in Hungary, Hinshu in Taiwan, other places in Finland, Seoul in Korea, uh, and more interestingly, and perhaps less expectedly, places in Russia, St. Petersburg, fine, you know, we all know St. Petersburg. Ekaterinburg, you may never have heard of, I don't know. It used to be called Sverdlovsk, before the end of the Soviet Union. And uh, the interest of that place, as compared to many others, is it was kind of the heart or the door to the Soviet academic cities the places where the Russians were doing military research and space research. And since they had very little computer power, very little capabilities to do complex simulations on computers, they had retained a remarkable capability to do advanced mathematics and advanced simulations basically on a, on a pencil and paper basis. Uh, and that gave huge interest because they can design complex modeling processes and complex simulation processes more effectively than nearly anywhere else in the world. In an interesting way, actually, a lot of the people who used to do this in Russia have also moved to Israel, and it's one of the reasons why Israel should actually also be on that list, uh, the same way beyond even the way it is right now. So, there are lots of places to learn from around the world. That is the point I want to make. If a company or if a country wants to become the one and wants to gain leadership, there is a huge advantage to saying, how do we bring knowledge from various places around the world and rather than just rely on our home base and how do we, how do we merge, how do we meld? Meld is a wonderful English word. I'm not sure you can translate it into Korean. It's the idea of on the one side melting, like snow is melting, and on the other side, welding, like you weld various metals into a stronger alloy. So it's taking something, having it transform into liquid and then transforming into something stronger. So it's the idea there is how to bring knowledge from all over the world, have it meld into something stronger than each piece of knowledge taken separately. So to summarize the first part of my argument, the basic point there is that there are pockets of technologies around the world which are underexploited, which may have been scattered, which may have been locally imprisoned, which are embedded in their local context, which are somewhat tacit, and therefore are going to require an effort to be captured, are going to be difficult to integrate, but can be integrated, 
And if you succeed, or if a company succeeds, or if a country succeeds in integrating those capabilities and those pieces of knowledge, there can be tremendous advantage. What does that take? Is the point I now want to turn to, second main point in my argument. If you look at the history of multinational companies, and this comes from a survey we did with uh, Booz Allen a few years ago in 2007, and we were asking people in 179 multinational companies why did they move their international activities or why did they internationalize their R&D activities uh, and how did it differ over time. To cut a long story short, if you go back to the 1970s and before, a lot of this was just, it just happened. We bought companies, we expanded, we decided that uh, we wanted to be close to manufacturing and so on. Things changed a little bit when you moved to the 1980s. Market and customers became more important. And if you look at it recently, in the early 2000s, you find that the main drivers among these 179 companies, the main drivers of internationalization of R&D, were on the one side to access skills and competencies, exactly the argument I was presenting, and on the other side to gain market and customer insight. Um, so what you find there is a much more strategic, much more purposive, much more purposeful way of thinking about how to deploy research and development resources. So companies are now doing it. More and more are doing it, and it's difficult to do. If you do it successfully, there are huge benefits. Just to take an example, I'm going to speak about Juliet Packard for a minute. Um, Juliet Packard moved the center of, the printers of its printer's operation to Singapore back in the early 1990s. You look at it 10 years later in 2002 when we did a detailed study of Singapore, uh, and you find that relatively little is left. There is a little bit of design for manufacturing, but manufacturing is done in China, Malaysia, and a few other places, and most of research and development is done in the US. On the other hand, if you look at cartridges, the ink cartridges that go into printers, you find a very, very different picture. You find that locally within Singapore, a whole kind of innovation ecosystem has been built. The man who used to lead Juliet Packard in Singapore has brought new investors foreign companies like Bayer, 3M, and DuPont, and many others. He has also, in a sense, partnered or got into a close customer-supplier relationship with local companies. He's supporting manufacturing in Puerto Rico and Ireland, where there are relatively little competence locally to compete with him. And the center of the world for cartridges, which are the more as you know, the more profitable piece and the more interesting piece of the business has remained in Singapore. Why? Essentially because of this innovation ecosystem, which is deeply rooted within the Singaporean environment and now is a very difficult piece of capability, if you wish, to compete against. And that explains part of the leadership of Juliet Packard in printers and continued strengths of the company. So it, the idea is also to say, tap into sources of knowledge and sources of capabilities that are going to be strongly locally rooted, not into kind of isolated pieces of knowledge that may be available. So go for the deeply rooted side. When we looked at companies, and we did research on this for the past few years, when we looked at the companies which were in the process of doing this, we essentially found out that they thought about how to compete very differently from traditional companies. First and foremost in their mind was to say, how do I get the highest possible share of relevant knowledge? How do I learn the most from the world as I can? And then essentially I will use that knowledge to fuel innovation, and then I will move these, innovation, these innovations into the operating day-to-day manufacturing, marketing, and sales, and so on, which will translate into market share. So rather than, share, rather than think about market share first, they were thinking about knowledge share first, and then saying, how do we move the knowledge into innovation and into market? So another way to think of it is to say, we are competing for knowledge, 
In order to do this, we need to go around the world and prospect and sense that knowledge. We are competing for innovation, so we need to essentially exploit the melding of that knowledge, the combination of that knowledge, this convergence of what we bring from all over the world successfully. And thirdly, we are competing for a share of market, which means that we are scaling up operations into successful products and services. And that's where the idea of being able to provide a total solution becomes increasingly important as well. So that's the way, that's the mindset. Compete for knowledge, compete for excellence in creating and powering magnets, and compete for customer solutions. Another way to think of it very simply is to say there is the traditional map of the operating plane with plants and sales offices and uh, technical service centers and call centers and the like. And there is also something which is very different from this, which is what we call the sensing plane, which is this network of locations around the world where we can essentially look at various types of knowledge being acquired. Some of them may be in the same places as the manufacturing location, like Singapore for Hewlett-Packard in cartridges. Some of them may be located in very different places. Intel has seen Israel grow in importance in terms of its sources of innovation. They manufacture a little bit in Israel, but not all that much. Uh, so they don't necessarily need to be in the same place. And then what you need in order to build the sensing capabilities to say first, let's look actively around the world. And companies typically don't do this. Companies like us human beings don't look very far, neither very far away, nor very far in the future. We tend to look very much in what surrounds us, what's relatively immediately accessible. Be able to anticipate new hotspots, not just follow. One of the challenges, in a sense, again, whether it's for a country or for a company, when one moves from being a follower to aspiring to become a leader, is where to look for new knowledge ceases to be obvious. You have to anticipate where you might be able to learn from, uh, and you have to kind of start to think much more about what are the critical trends, and where are these trends being likely to be manifesting themselves to become obvious, if you wish, to become reality more quickly. It's interesting, for instance, uh, Finland says, you know, we can be a leader in aging gracefully. It's true that they are going to have a very rapidly, like Japan, a very rapidly aging population. It's true also, a bit like Japan too, that some of that old elderly population is distributed in many relatively isolated villages. And that raises all kinds of issues around distance, I mean, telemedicine, using mobility solutions to monitor health care of people, and so on and so forth, which then obviously resonate with companies like Nokia and others. So they want really to become a leader of aging gracefully or wellness in aging, if you wish. So try to anticipate where the lead customers will be. That's an obvious one because it's a demographic trend. The good thing about demographic trends is you can predict them. You know them 20 years ahead. Uh, many of the trends are much more difficult. But it's basically being able to anticipate. It's being able also to think about your existing units and not treat them as delivery pipelines, but treat them as sources of knowledge, places where to learn from. Building a sensing network is another option, just saying we'll develop alliances with customers, suppliers, universities, all kinds of sources of knowledge, and essentially we'll be able to deploy explorers around the world interacting with these partners to be able to provide us with advantage. And then finally, what we have observed is companies also saying, and also actually doing, saying we need to make this a job. If we just make it a slogan, it's going to be wishful thinking. Nothing much is going to happen. Therefore, you know, make it a job, provide the right incentives, provide the right job definitions and the like. So in other words, it's a very, very determined effort. It is not something that happens all by itself. 
You find a good example of this, as I was saying earlier, in Shiseido, for instance, which hired some remarkable people, both on the business side, like this lady Chantal Rose, who used to run Yves Saint Laurent perfumes in France, uh, and also on the designer's side, where they found cross-cultural designers, like Issey Miyake, and also they hired Jean-Paul Gaultier. Uh, and in just a few years, they were able to come from nowhere to being actually the leading perfume company, the leading fragrance company in the world. They built a plant in France, they engaged into partnerships and alliances, and what they are now trying to do, which is difficult and, and relatively so, is to say, can we bring some of that knowledge back from France into our operations in Japan? So essentially, can we make our product uh, managers in Yokohama able to develop these kind of capabilities as well? Or can we get our plants to be able to learn from the, the French system? But the idea really, the central idea I want to leave with you this morning is, you know, think of the world as a place to learn from whether you are a company or whether you are a country, and think about this capability to become a magnet or to build the right magnets. Another company that has done this remarkably well is ST Microelectronics. They have done it in a slightly different way because they are doing essentially B2B electronic component processors type of businesses. They did it through a series of partnerships with leading partners and customers um, in a very complex way. This is just one, don't try to read the small print, you can't, but it's just one map of one particular product, hard disk drive controllers, back in the 1990s. If you look at ST Microelectronics, there are dozens of maps like this, where various critical elements of knowledge come from all very different places around the world and are integrated and are melded through some specific capability. So sensing needs to be deployed, it needs to be specific to customers, and most organizations find it difficult to do, that, to do that. Why is it so difficult? Well, because here together now is so natural. It's seen as really, so many things happen in a sense, when people work in a co-located environment, which are not going to happen otherwise. And knowledge is messy and sticky, so it's difficult to move. Let me not spend too much time on this. I just want to leave you with two messages around sensing, in conclusion. Sensing is more than gathering business intelligence or technology scanning. Because the knowledge is complex, because it's increasingly behavioral, because it's increasingly B2C consumers mattering more and more, because it has to be oriented toward total solutions, it means that it has to be learned in context. The more complex the knowledge, the more you have to be there, and the more you have to co-practice, the more you have to be involved, the more you have to be, in a way, almost in the local minds of the people who hold the knowledge. And therefore, it is not just reading reports, it is not just sending missions, it is not just doing things easily. And then the second point is, the point I was making earlier, which is really critical, which is in order to be successful, you need to anticipate new sources of knowledge, not just to follow the bandwagon, and not just to go where everyone else is going. And therefore, you need to leapfrog competitors, and you need also to, bro to uh, break the traditional dogmas that companies normally have. Last point here, and I will leave you with the schema, is we need the magnets in the middle. In order to link these sensing units into operations, we need to run innovation projects, we, in, we need to run knowledge integration processes, and therefore we have a complex process there. But you can think of it as three different planes, if you wish. The operating plane, which is problem-driven, the magnet plane, which is opportunity-driven, and the sensing plane, which is idea and imagination-driven. So I think, perhaps in conclusion, and again in the context of this transition here in Korea, from having been a follower to becoming a leader in terms of economy, it's really to say how do we complement what we know do, how to do so well, which is operations, with this capability for sensing, with this capability for, for 
learning from the world in order to innovate for the world? And how do we put in place these magnets, which apply both at the national level, but also apply very much at the corporate level? And I think to me this is one of the most critical ideas, is to say how do we create the relevant magnets and how do we put them in place? So that's the message I wanted to share with you very briefly this morning. Thank you very much.